Welcome many thanks for staying with us on the program. You're still watching Super Done here on Super Screen Television. Um, we know that recently in Kano State, the governor, Gandhiji, um split the traditional council from into four, um, away from the, uh, the Emirates, sorry, that's the Emirates into four. Um, apart from the Kano Emirates, you have um, Emirates like Bichi, um, Rano, Gaia, and, and then that generated some sort of controversy. But just after that, we're seeing cases in just where the traditional council is also being split. And then um, just, I think, yesterday where the commissioner for local government in um, Ogun State also resigned because the, he said the Ogun State governor is trying to um, also do the same in um, some in, in local government in, um, in, in Ogun State. And that's you know, generating controversy around the country. People are wondering whether this is some sort of unanimous move um, to, to whittle the power, whittle down the power of traditional rulers in the country or if this is just some, if this is a, um, something that is happening simultaneously by mistake, maybe it's just happening and it's not, you know, some sort of plan. Um, but why is it happening now? Why are we seeing this break in Emirates, in, in traditional um, areas where or councils and governors just, you know, your state, it also happened where there are now um, some chiefs in the palace of your Lubadon was, you know, were elevated. Uh, to be on the same rank as you, as your Lubado. In, in Plato State now, there are 12 first class, as, as, as it stands, there are 12 first class um, traditional leaders in that state. And so people are wondering what's going on with the traditional council and traditional institution in Nigeria. And they were looking at the influence of politics, you know, on the traditional council um, or traditional institution in the country. And to help us have this conversation, we have a legal practitioner, Destiny Takon, with us. Many thanks for coming on the My program. My pleasure. It's good to be here. Thank you very good much. Good morning, um, um, viewers. We just want to remind our viewers that you can call in um, as the conversation continues. Um, be sure to call in and make your opinion known as to what's happening to the traditional institution in the country. Um, you see what's going on. Um, you saw the, aside from your state, um, we're seeing it in Kano, although um, the, the court of law has reversed that of, of Kano. And then we've seen, uh, we've seen that of Ugu and Joss. And Joss, what do you think is happening? I am scared. Um, <clears throat> I wasn't raised in the city. I'm very proud of that. I know African values. I know cultural values. My father was a custodian, known in all of our own communities, many around, as a custodian of <coughs> custom. And um, on the day he died, there were testimonies all over and wondering, what do we do? That our encyclopedia of custom is gone. Now, <coughs> It's, it's very dangerous. It, it's, it's what it portends is very, very dangerous for the fabric of our society. You know, you can tell that a Yoruba man, a typical Yoruba man would react this way or that way regarding certain things because he's a Yoruba man. You can also tell that an Igbo man, when it has to do with issues of custom or tradition, you can always bet, all right? An Igbo man, a Yoruba man, somebody from a Hausa man, you know, somebody from Boki, where I'm from, will react when it has to do with tradition. And tradition has a way, we must not pretend, right. of holding society, the, the nuclear society, in place. It has its values. And um, these values are, you know, what the people are raised with that gives them that identity that I, I'm talking about that mm -hmm. you can most certainly point at when issues of tradition or culture are involved and a man talks, you can always say, or oh, oh. by the time you see a young man, the balling, you know, from a distance, oh, that's Yoruba, for instance, you know, and, and you see somebody with an obi, you know, turban or whatever, cab or whatever they call it, you know, that's somebody from, so, <clears throat> They, they are better, there might be better instances, but of course, the, lis the listeners know what I'm saying. Now, these values, when you decide to politicize, because that's exactly what is happening. Mm -hmm. When you decide to politicize it and say, under the laws, the governor and um, the state assemblies have powers. You know, there are so many things. All things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. Right? 
it, it's not sufficient to just want to show that, okay, the traditional institution is subject at law to, you know, uh, the laws of the state. You might be creating, you know, a monstrous situation that would create violence and chaos that the state instruments of force cannot even contain. Well, the state instrument of force can contain situations because the people are not really agitated. When the people get agitated, you discover that how many policemen do you have compared to the population of Nigerians, for instance? How many soldiers do you have? If something were to happen, if there could be any such thing, all right, that would get all of Nigerians agitated at once and say enough is enough, there's no force that can restrain the people. There's none. The soldiers are insufficient, they will be insufficient, and so would be the police. And so, uh, politicizing the traditional institutions across the country portends very serious danger for the fabric of our society because it is going to destroy our identities, it's going to destroy what has hurt us, you know, and given us, you know, that identity I talked about, and with that, You'll be breathing disobedience. You'll be breathing intolerance. You'll be breathing a situation where, I don't, let's take the North for instance. Typically, that immediate had existed for as long as after Mandan for you. Mm. <clears throat> as much as we know in Nigeria, it has been there. The Emir of Kano, subject only to is it the Emir of Sokoto or so, or is it of Gwendo, I don't know which, mm. but I think one of them is the most it's superior. Sultan of Soko Sokoto. Fine, Sultan of, Sultan of Sokoto. You know, so you, you now want to destabilize that because you think that the Emma will so much power with the people. Forgetting that that power is a power that held society in place until Ganduji was born and grew up to be a man. It is that influence over the people. We know that in the North, because of the, the, the perfect blend of tradition and religion, or custom and religion, so to say, traditional religion, I want to say, because religion is part of custom. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, you have the people subservient to the emir, and whatever the emir says is law, is virtually final, you know, and so you come in as governor after several uh, centuries, at least two and a half centuries or so, of uh, the existence of that emirate, and you think because the emir, you know, uh, has such powers you want to whittle them, you're forgetting that when you do that, first of all, there wouldn't be a rivalry between the four emirates you've created, traditionally. Apart from the fact that that allegiance and subservience that the people had to that traditional stew has also whittled down, and you divide allegiance, and with the division of allegiance also comes the, very, the probability of fractions and and violence and, you know, one emirate wanting to wield power above the other and all of that. Those who are, you know, um, uh, those who are, uh, how do I put it now, who, 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 who are inclined to one emirate or the other, you know, want to go along with their emma against the other ones. Um, I have said here on the last show, when they came here about last week, I said, very, as a Nigerian, at my station in life, I feel very, very bad about it, you know. And as somebody who grew up within the traditional settings and knows a lot about these things, I feel very bad about it. But, but it does not happen in my local government or in my state, but I don't have to wait. But do you think that Nigerians um, feel the way you feel? Because it looks, it looks like, look, everybody has moved on, moved on from that traditional era where um, these leaders wield, wielded a lot of power. Do you think at this point Nigerians still care that these leaders still wield that much influence over the people? Yes, I, I think that every Nigerian who, who has my background, you know, it's different where like our children that were born and raised in Lagos, they, it, they are the ones who would very easily move on mm -hmm. because they wouldn't really understand what I'm saying or what this portends, you know, so, but I think the majority of Nigerians who have my background, uh, have not and will not move on with it, they will most certainly be saying what I'm saying because, you see, what you're causing in, what you cause in all of those societies, 
you cause a situation where people who are subservient will realize that you were not, you only deified, you only mystified, you only larger than life. All right? And because they now know that, they would not respond and react the way they used to before. The restraint that they had, especially for the youths. I give the note, for instance, where you have uh, the Amajoris growing up and people, you know, into it's a case system that, um, you know, keeps people in place. Otherwise, even parents accepting that a child I give birth to I can be thrown on the street to go live and survive. But today you have, for me, my thinking as a Nigerian, the major recruits for Boko Haram are from that Amajori case system. That's my belief, strongly. The major recruits for, um, you know, the militants or what do you call them, those who attack people in the north, you know, we lay people, not just because the, the, the kidnappers, the bandits, are from those amajuries, mm. you know. And so when you do this, you, you give occasion to breed a lot more. And right now, I think that there is still a high regard for that traditional institution. You know, if this, what, what, what was done uh, doesn't succeed, all right, the people, they are still, the largest same way if the Imam speaks, if the Sultan speaks, because the person is a Muslim and sees the Sultan as a ruler put in place by God. And because he, he's, he's a religious fanatic, that means he's, his concept of Islam is so strong that he believes that, all right, indeed, Allah put the Sultan there. So he would listen to the Sultan or to the Imam. But when you whittle down those powers, you will create that so as you create a monstrous society where you, it will be a lot of rebels, where there will be a lot of violence, where there will be anarchy. And I think that's what that put in, anarchy. Most of these thrones also um, precede these uh, political offices. Um, most of these thrones have been there even before um, Nigeria was, it became Nigeria. Um, how come they, are, they were then put under governors? Do you think that that was a wise move? Even when the white, it, it came from the concept, came from the colonial days. When the colonials, colonial laws put our traditional institutions that are met on the ground under the, the state. That's, that's the way it was. And so what we've done, like, like every other aspect of, you know, we just copy, we rehash, we, you know, uh, just interpolate, you know, what, uh, even what exists somewhere or what the white man, the colonial masters, you know, brought in. So we've accepted that. And that's why our laws are in that, that form, in that shape, putting them under. You know, it, it's, it's a kind of row, like what the state had with the church mm. in the early stage of human development, the development of human society. There was that row between the state and the church, you know, as to which was under or which was greater. Until we must understand like what, how that was resolved to understand that the traditional institution is, is different. Even if the law, that's why I say all things are lawful but not expedient. Even if the law has given you powers that you might be able to do that, but you should know better not to do that, to know that these are two separate institutions which normally should be like equals of some sort and should exist parallel, you know, without uh, friction. You know, I, until we come to understand that and allow things to be, we are Africans. I'm not saying that we are, we are, we are, you know, um, static. We evolved, but evolution of society shouldn't come suddenly, or for political considerations. It should be according to the will and the wish of the people, not of some people who ordinary, but for politics do not even qualify of a truth. That is one major problem we have today. We're even in Lagos where we are, and in every other part of Nigeria. I give you know, there, there are some families that were known, in Lagos for instance, mm. to have held lands over even centuries, who have been recognized and respected. But because of politics, one talk, you know, who is, who holds sway of Onipan for instance, is used to snipe ballot boxes or intimidate people mm -hmm. and put somebody in power. And then the person decides to, for political um, gratification, 
to give him a position. Maybe commissioner of local chieftaincy affairs or local government or whatever. Or he becomes, he goes to the state of assembly and ends up as a speaker from a thug. And that's what's happening in our country today. What do you expect from that kind of person as a leader? A person who has no ideals, no integrity, who has no substance, who has suddenly, because of politics, God for that reason and all of that, found himself suddenly in the mantle of power. What he would do? So you have a situation where, for instance, the Land Use Act, acquisition of land, the families who have held lands in Lagos and in other parts of the country for several centuries who have kept it. Even the Bible says that a good father leaves an inheritance for his children and his children's children. But it has changed with the set of leaders we have today in Nigerians who have evolved out of lack, a, a political process that lacks integrity. Where just about anybody, I'm sorry to say that I'm on air, but if, if a good father picked a dog and says, this dog is going to be governor after me, this dog is going to be go to the National Assembly or to the State House Assembly, it happens. Because of that, you don't have a situation where even those families, and even against what God said in his word, they pounce on those lands in the name of acquisition. Land streets have been kept there. People whose fathers were not able to afford to buy a stone. It was their destiny. I'm not in any way looking down on anybody. Mm. It was their destiny, the destiny of their fathers. All right? But the children of these people, because of thuggery and God for that reason and the nature of politics we play, suddenly find themselves in a position of authority. They pounce on those lands. They have acquired them. And what do they do? They share those lands amongst themselves. It's the kind of thing you see happening with all of these states where people who should actually not mantle power. Because it, it, the sad commentary of our country is the fact that you have people with dead conscience, as I call them, people without integrity, who have mantled power through the process I've talked about all over the country, and they are the ones ruling over people of integrity, people of substance, educated people, people who should actually you know, be the ones who have the foresight and not the ones, you know, um, the saddle of, of power in our country today. In my view as a Nigerian, how should we, for instance, have a president? That's my view. How would we have a president who, whose certificates are questionable? They cannot be seen or produced or found, and it's an issue in courts and, and, and public, court of public domain and, in, and the courts of law. You know, that's for instance. Okay, because you mentioned the certificates, um, we know that before now, uh, you, when you think of a traditional ruler or a traditional leader, anywhere, the first thing that comes to your mind is some, some illiterate somewhere in a village who is leading, you know, settling a, a village dispute. But these days, you know, traditional leaders are barristers. Most of them have been ambassadors for the country. Um, they are, some of them are doctors, some of them are professors, like, like PhD. Like, like Sanusi was. Exactly, some of them have a CBN. So these are no longer people who are not educated. So do you think that that law should be revised in a way that they are not put on that governors but allowed to um, be, be independent of political offices? Yes, I, I think that um, at, even at law, you know, in virtually every city, you have the chief's law. It are chiefs and, mm. like in the West, or chiefs and Oba, Obas and chief's law. Mm. You have that. And in, even in the North, I'm sure the, the such laws, you know, through which, of course, they were trying to create more emirates in, in Kano State. Mm. And of a truth, there is no friction. That's my view. There is indeed no friction, except where certain people who, like I said, suddenly have found square pegs in round holes, found themselves mantling power, who decide to start questioning the traditional institutions that have held up our societies in place for centuries, as I said. You know, so they begin to, uh, if, if there's going to be an ev evolution, I've said, if there's going to be an, if it should be, if the society should evolve, mm. it, it, it doesn't come from you know, some, some of those fellows that I said suddenly wanting to square up with the Oba or the Emir or the Sultan and then come up with some law to pass in the state. It should be an agitation that has existed that should come from bottom up, from the people, you know, not from, um, from these people. 
you know, who are mantling power. So I'm saying that there's, there's really no friction, as it were, other than the desire of people who maybe like our children that like we were born in Lagos, who have, as I said earlier, do not understand the, the, thing, the things that we know about tradition and custom, mm. who don't care, you know, like the children of the very opulent, very rich, who have never felt hungry, who have never walked without shoes, whose parents never struggled to pay their school fees, you know, his father was governor or speaker or whatever, and then of course, traditionally as it is here, the young man grows up, the father elects, appoints him or elects him to take one position or the other. They cannot feel the suffering of the people. They cannot feel the station in life of the people. They cannot understand what people are going through. It's difficult, almost impossible for them to do so, unless they have good advisors. Because they may not understand if you say that a child could actually sleep hungry. There are lots of children sleeping hungry as we speak today. There are lots of children who walk several kilometers to school in Lagos as we speak. They were chauffeur driven to school. So when we have, so maybe there should be some kind of, um, orient, if, if you're going to mantle power, we should allow before you're sworn in or before you're investiture, give you some orientation. We must have that in place. It's very important. For three months, for instance, or two months, where people would educate them on these things, for them to understand what it means to be a leader over other people. You may have been opportuned, but not everybody is or was. It's very important. Okay, um, I want to take a comment by um, the, the, the one of the traditional rulers in Jos, the Bongwam of Jos, and then uh, he's also the chairman, Petu Council of Chiefs, um, Jacob Ubagiang, and he said that the state governors do not have the authority to redefine traditional boundaries. And he said government cannot redefine boundaries where there is no problem. And that the state governors create, uh, it, they should read the custom, something about customary law and all of that. And I want to ask, ask you about that. Do they have the right, do the state governors have the right to redefine boundaries? Because he's saying they don't have that right to do, do so. Yeah, well, they do have a right of law. Or uh, well, I don't know if the, 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 the state laws of plateau are different. But what I've seen compared to what I know about several states, around the country. Uh, they do have the right, as I said, it's all things are lawful, but all things are not expedient. Um, he's right in the sense to say, of course, where there are no agitations, where there are no conflicts, why do you want to create? Because that's what is happening in Kano. Mm. Gandhi is creating friction in Kano where there was none. There was none in the Emirate. The people, that's what I say, it should be from bottom up. The people never agitated for it. They didn't want the man out. They didn't want the Emma out. They didn't complain. But the man just felt like, oh, if, for what happened in the elections. And that's how the kind of people I talked about, like, like him, that's my view. That's how they react. Immediately after the elections, seeing what transpired. Okay, you think you have so much power. I will show you that I'm the governor of the state. Mm -hmm. And this is what the state law says. That's what's happening in Canada. That's what happened. That's my opinion. Do you think that this might become a general problem? Because it started in you know, your state, and then we're seeing it in Kano, in, in Jos, and then in, uh, in, in, in um, Ogun State. And just recently, we're hearing reports that uh, youths in Benin were protesting because the indications that the governor was also planning to do the same thing. Uh, do you think that this might become a general problem in the country? Well, that's what it portends. That's what it's showing. That's, that's a kind of the, the evil win. That's what I call it. It's an evil win. Uh, it's blowing from centrifugally, you know, and, and so it spirals across is what is happening. And um, I'm afraid, you know, that's the first thing I said. <laughs> I, 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 I express my, my fear, fear in the sense of what this portends, mm -hmm. where it's going. And that's exactly what I think is, is happening. But uh, more so, I reckon that it appears to be part of the change the change atmosphere that we inherited since 2015. How, how is, um, what I, because again, it's it almost looking like traditional rulers and governors cannot coexist. 
um, that it look, sometimes these traditional rulers you wield so much power for the governors to handle because people respect the throne whether you know we like it or not. That's right. Um, especially in places where they are first class rulers, people would defer to the throne. You know, ask what decision if, if, in a place like you know if uh, um, or your Ibadjo Benin, people exactly. will ask what has the other said exactly. before about this issue before asking what has the governor said. Um, so how can governors and traditional rulers um, work together to at least give the people the, the or deliver to the people the dividends of democracy? It's for each office to respect the boundaries, like the um, the plateau traditional rulers say. Don't redefine them. Don't attempt to whittle down any. Like I said, there should be no friction because in of, 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 of a truth, these institutions can exist as they have always existed parallel to each other. Only um, they can coexist, synergizing when necessary. You cannot, the Oba has the powers he has and he's always, he's always had them. Even after we know that the Obas don't even have the powers of heart, for instance, in the 18th century. In the 18th century, from what we read, that we understand, if an Oba wanted your wife, he has, he, he has her. If he wants your head for protesting, <laughs> as he takes your wife, he gets your head. So we, we've done so the things that were repugnant to natural justice. Those were the things that the white man took away, that we, are, we inherited, and that we applaud. But other than whatever is repugnant, we should let the traditional institutions stay, unless to the extent of the repugnancy of whatever policies, orders, directives, or practices. Only to that extent. Otherwise, let them be the way they are. They have held our societies. We talk today, the African woman, even in the United States of America, the black woman disciplines her child or black family, mm -hmm. different from the way the white do. Mm -hmm. That's the African touch. That is what dignifies and distinguishes us from the white man. After several centuries, after slavery, the black people in the United States, in Britain, in Canada, and elsewhere, see whole steadfastly to those ideals. And that's why the black child stands out of a truth with issues of discipline and obedience and all of that. Um, Barista Destiny, do you also think that because somehow, as people say, that maybe these trolls have been politicized and that's why the governors can, can do whatever they want to because look, uh, some of these trolls have been bought with money, have been given money, um, cars, whatever they want during elections. And most of them have been politicized. So governors take advantage of that. What would you say to that? Well, it's a test equation. It's a trillion naira question. Well, maybe, um, I don't know. I, it's not something for me to say on air. But <laughs> yeah, well, I, I know, I agree that um, We've seen a lot of money politics in a short while, you know, paying for votes, you know, uh, parties paying for votes during elections. Mm. We saw that especially during the by-elections or supplementary elections in states, in various states around up to the 2019 elections, where I even witnessed, I saw it with my eyes, even though those who were sharing that money see failed <laughs> in that polling booth where I was. Mm. You know, so um, yes, there is a very possibility of um, a politicization, politicization of um, the traditional institution. But is that not the Emma or the Oba or the Eze that you bought over? <clears throat> Does this is influence to the extent that it tells the people we will vote APC alone or PDP alone? I don't seem to be aware of that. I'm not aware that's what happened in Kano, mm. in Ogun State, in Joss, or, or in your State. It's not what happened. So to that extent, because as a person, the traditional uh, ruler should have his choice. That's what election is about. He's a Nigerian, he's entitled to vote. Mm. And he, has, he should have the choice of his candidate. So he can vote whoever he, he chooses. So other than that, I'm not aware, and where it, it doesn't exist, 
and it will be very difficult for that to happen, to come out and tell the entire people in the Emirate, in the Sultanate, or within the territory, the kingdom of the Oba, and say, let's vote this party alone. It is not, I mean, that's why, for instance, we have issues in various states. I recall what happened in Lagos with, uh, after the election, some big people sending some thugs out there to destroy shops and intimidate, you know, uh, the people of a certain ethnic extraction for not uh, yielding to uh, a certain pattern of voting. So it's always very difficult to detect, that's what I mean. That's where I'm going, to tell the people, vote this party and the people will do that. All right, I wish we could continue this conversation, but we do have to go. Um, as we'll continue to follow up this conversation because a lot of issues are unfolding. Um, but we want to thank our guests from Co Committee this morning. Thank you so much. My pleasure, Vice as always. For coming thank you. And helping us understand the powers of the governor and how um, the traditional institution and the political institution can work together to deliver the dividends of democracy to um, Nigerians. And just in the Daily Sun this morning, there's information that just because the, uh, the uh, Ganduje won without uh, the Emir, because he was bipartisan, and that might have informed um, his, his, the anger, but that's what the, the quote on the Daily Sun. We will continue to follow this issue. We promise you that, and we'll bring you more information on it. Many thanks to everyone who made, made today's program a success, to Peculiar, to Jabril, to Anthony, to um, my cameraman, Shego, and to my supervising producer, Ali and Annabelle. Many thanks to every one of you. I am Precious Amayu. Do enjoy the rest of our programs on Super Screen Television.